talking to you, depending on where you are at. Uh, again, this is Joe Grabowski with Treasury Talent, joined as always by Simon, actually on Simon's profile. So, uh, Simon, thanks for hosting us. How are you? I'm very well, Joe. I'm, I'm super excited to uh, finally get uh, accepted to LinkedIn Live. And this is really exciting to be my first ever live session on my own web, uh, my own LinkedIn profile. So, yeah, really excited about it. Great, great. And uh, Scotty, as always, in Utah, what's up? Well, I think next week we'll be doing this live from your um, uh, profile, Joe. That's the, the trend here. So, um, but no, it's, it's good. We're excited to, to have more uh, individuals here in the treasury community being able to join us um, today. So, and in Utah, all good things. Weather is, it, it snowed the other day, but we're back to uh, basically spring-like conditions. Perfect, perfect. And we're not even going to talk about what's happening out this way. I'm going to switch the focus over to Adesola. We are very fortunate to be joined by Adesola Arimalati, uh, the Director of Treasury over at Kiwi.com, and he's joining us from the UK. Adesola, how are you? Fine, thank you. I feel great to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, of course. Uh, how many cups of coffee deep are you? Because if we're, if we're coming up on, what, 10 o'clock? Yeah, just about 10 o'clock here in England. Perfect. Well, we appreciate you making it a late night and, uh, and joining us. And, um, you know, as always, what we're going to do is uh, Treasury Talent or Simon's, Simon's group, Simon's network. If you have questions for Out of Solar or for us along the way, please feel free to join in, comment, anything like that. We're more than happy to accommodate these questions. Um, Scotty, I'm going to ask you, I don't know what's happened here, but I cannot see any of the questions. So if you could just join that live chat and monitor that, that would be awesome. Um, sorry, Joe, you want me to, to join and, and monitor uh, the questions? If you could, yeah, if you could just watch on Simon's profile for any kind of questions or anything that's coming in that way, I think would be good. Okay, you got it. I'm going to do that, but I'm going to start with a question of my own. And, and again, thank you for joining us today, Adesola. Um, your treasury career includes experience in banking and uh, transition to the corporate side. I'm curious, what would you say have been some of the highlights for you along the way? Well, the highlights for me, I suppose, the first thing I would say is um, I feel quite fortunate to be able to recreate my career twice. Um, so I started working in Nigeria first. I got into banking, um, into international banking, and I made um, quite a few movements within banking then um, from Citibank, and then I went to, to start the Chartered Bank. And then eventually I ended up in Starcom, which was a telecom service provider as the treasury manager. And um, in 2006, I came over to the UK uh, and started again from scratch, working for um, a telecoms company in Manchester, went into banking again, and now I'm back in Treasury. So for me, the first highlight is the fact that I've been able to um, recreate my career twice. I think the other thing again is, um, I would say, um, it's the ability to be able to move from one industry, from one sector really, to another. Um, I've found out as... It's quite challenging because one of the things you find uh, or I've found between banking and corporate is there's a difference in culture, total difference in culture in how things are done. So risk is a good example. Um, for example, I worked for some of the banks where risk was a key factor. It's, it's your bread and butter when you're in banking, but not so much emphasis in corporate. And emphasis on risk, but it's very different. So, I mean, these are some of the examples I give in terms of the, um, the highlight. And I think... Again, for me, banking, working in banking has given me an opportunity to learn quite a lot um, across the spectrum of banking. And being able to move from one side to the other side allows you to see the bigger picture. When you're banking, sometimes you don't get to feel the pressure that you have on the other side uh, to manage costs and make sure that you're profitable. When you get to the other side, you're looking at your own balance sheet, you're looking at your own business, and it's 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 it can be quite different in terms of the outlook and the size also. And so, and so I was just, those are some of the highlights that I've seen um, in my transition from corporate into banking. Adesola, you've, you've had a great career so far. And as you say, you've moved around um, and moved globally and, and that's been fabulous. What's the one piece of advice that you would have for, for the listeners out there uh, that you wish you had have known back when you were 25 that you know now that you'd like to impart on them? Um, I think I'll pick, I'll pick a few. Um, one of the things I'll say is 
if I'd known earlier in my career, I probably would have gone and done all my academic qualifications and professional qualifications much earlier in my career. And the reason why I say that is the older you get, the more difficult it is for you to study. And it's harder for you to get the motivation to study. Um, I have done quite a lot of studying um, since my 20s. Um, I went and got a postgraduate diploma, for example, in law, which I felt was useful for me, commercial law. But it, my younger self, I would say, do all your, your, your qualification and your studying as quickly as possible um, when you're much younger. Um, I think the other thing I would say is travel a lot um, when you're much younger. And I will link that up to and, and experience different things. And the reason why I say that is because when you travel, and you get to work in different parts of the world, your, your worldview is broadened very, very quickly. And you get to, to develop a big network of colleagues from different parts of the world. So for me, I would say, you know, get all your qualification in very early, um, all your studying very early and travel. If you have the opportunity to work abroad, move abroad quite early, you know, imbibe yourself in a culture, make a big, um, a big play of the network and that will be quite useful for you as you go on within your career. Uh, those yeah. are the two things I would I would um, I would advise a younger me to do. I, I think you're uh, you're hitting a soft spot with Simon there. He always talks about being a good global citizen, and I know that's really important for him and his children. And um, Simon, I mean, that, that's got to be resonating with you. Uh, you. The listeners will know very well that I'm a big fan of uh, moving globally. I think you learn a lot about yourself. Yeah. Um, you learn a lot about you know different parts of the world and yeah I, I, there's I don't see any downside in doing it and I think you know you, you just test yourself in ways that you don't if you're in your comfy environment with your friends and family around all the time so yeah as the listeners know I'm, I'm a massive advocate and uh, I'm sure at a solo you'd, you'd probably uh, vouch to the same I am and I think one of the things I'll add to that is when you when you move abroad you get to learn a lot of new products maybe pick up an extra language here, there, and everywhere. And, and those are massive benefits for your career. Um, and I'm a big fan of networking. And you'll be, uh, I mean, I work for international banks where I've been fortunate to have colleagues all over the world. And that is a massive network of people. And just imagine if I'd gone abroad to work in maybe spent a few years in Japan or spent a few years in Hong Kong or Singapore. I'm not just the colleague that we talk to every time. I'm, I'm somebody that you see every day. And that's a powerful network and connection to build, especially early on in your career, because all these people will go into different places and all those places they go to will become opportunities too for you. So I'm a big fan of being a global citizen, really. And, and I think it's, it's good for your career, especially uh, in areas like treasury, transactional banking. Fantastic tool to have when you can speak languages and you have the experience of working abroad. Yeah. Well, because there are different cultural sensitivities when you're working in a global team as well, right? Like you, yeah. you have to know how to communicate, how to address people. And you don't you don't find that sitting in, sorry, Scotty, but you don't find it sitting in the mountains in Utah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you might get the feel. You might get the feel, you know, in terms of you, you are communicating with your colleagues on a daily basis, but it is very different. For me, I, I'm somebody that, that quite enjoys imbibing myself in the culture, you know. It's not just the working, it's the fact that on weekends you get to, you know, go into different places and generally broaden your view and get yourself immersed in the, in the culture and the experience and the places and the people. And all those things shape you as a young professional growing up. They make a big difference for you um, so that by the time you get to more senior position, not only do you have the, the technical bit, but you also have this cultural growth and development, the, the emotional intelligence you get from having worked in different parts of the world. You can't quantify how important they are. Absolutely. And Solon, I think that, that what you just said there is it nails it for me, is it's a, it teaches you emotional intelligence. And there's very small differences between cultures, you know, as long as we're all yeah. speaking the same language, the cultural sensitivities are quite, um, they're, they're just small and they're subtle, but they're really important. And, yeah. you know, I just think that teaches you uh, as, a, as an individual to be much better at reading people, at understanding people and at understanding yourself. So yeah, I, I, that you've just nailed it for me. Emotional intelligence is the, the yeah. most stark thing that I think you get out of it. And, and I think um, it makes you a better leader too. You know, when you transition through, it makes you a better leader. Um, 
I mean, I know, for example, moving from Nigeria to, to the UK, I, I got into a broader, um, into a broader network of people over here. I got to work with people from different parts of the world, which I didn't have back home. And again, you can't, you can't quantify, you can't easily quantify the benefit you get from that. And I could just imagine if I come to the UK when I was in my 20s, rather than in my late 30s, how different it would have been in terms of, you know, um, the, the bigger broad view I would have had earlier on in my career. Yeah. And uh, you've brought this up a couple of times just around how you are such a big fan of networking and relationships. What has been your approach to networking and relationships, especially being a global citizen uh, throughout your career? And what advice would you give to the audience along those lines? Um, I found a lot of the jobs I've had. Um, yeah, or let me just say some of the jobs I've had have come from my network, people recommending me for some of those roles. Um, and I think network is, it's not just networking for the purpose of building your career. I think networking goes beyond that. It's, it's developing different parts of your, of your personality, is increasing your, um, the people that you have in your, um, in your support structure, in your support network. Yeah. And also, it's, it's a two-way street. The more you network, the more you learn about yourself and you learn about other people. And there's always knowledge transfer when you build your network. And again, like I said, it's, it's building your network is like putting money into a bank, right? You're saving. You never know where you need to draw on it. And then yeah. one day you need to draw on that pool that you have network. So for me, networking is very, very important. And... It allowed, it's allowed me to broaden my interest. So I'll give you a good example. Um, I'm someone that's very comfortable walking into a room of strangers and having conversation with them. Mm -hmm. And why, why that is important for me or how I've been able to build that is I have a very broad interest. Um, I am not just a treasury professional, a finance professional. I immerse myself in knowledge. I consume knowledge. I read. I, I broaden my interest. So when I meet people, there's always something I can connect with. It might be, it might be literature, it might be, you know, it might be politics, it might be current affairs, but there's something that I will connect with. And when you can connect with people, then the conversation grows from there. But if you have nothing to connect, and the only thing you can talk about is work or your or your career, then it's difficult for you to build that network. So for me, networking is very important, but it's not just for the purpose of my career. For everything that happens to me, network is very important. Um, I do a lot of things outside, outside um, work and treasury, and I'm consistently building my network. So for me, networking is very, is very, very important. Yeah. Absolutely and, important. And uh, you're right. I mean, it's uh, especially with the uh, LinkedIn, social media, that type of stuff. Everything is pretty much a warm connection these days. There's usually some commonality that you can find to generate a conversation. I think a lot of people try to overthink that. Um, and even at these networking events or in different events, um, a lot of people will do like the LinkedIn find feature on your phone so everyone can find each other right there. And then that creates some commonalities with being able to connect with people too, which um, is invaluable to your point. I mean, that's how it, it takes barriers down immediately. People start talking to you if you start asking questions about them. It's, yeah, I, I love your approach to it. Yeah, and, and I think it's also about... Um, for me, network is not just about what you can get from that, it's what you can give into that. Yeah. Um, because when you are giving it to people, um, like I said, it's almost like putting money, saving money into a bank, into, yeah. into having a savings account, you are giving to people. Um, I, I've, uh, there, was, there, was, there was a content I wrote on LinkedIn where I said, when you're looking for a job, for example, one of the things I always encourage people is take time to go and help other job seekers. Don't just sit there and think, okay, I'll spend the whole day applying for jobs. Take an hour of your day and say, I'm going to go and read somebody's content who is looking for a job and contribute to that content. I'm going to go and encourage them. I'm going to go and, and share their content. Do something for them and build that network. And then people will be willing to do something for you during your own, when your own time comes. Yeah. And I think that's the way I approach network. It's not just about what can I gain from this relationship. It's about giving and giving and giving because I know that I'll get either directly from them or from somebody else. But it's about building that network. It's about building the pool of people uh, that you can support and people that can support you too. To follow your analogy, it's like your overdraft protection for that bank account. Exactly. You hope you don't have to draw on it, yes. but you keep building it up. 
Yep. Add us all. We're very big fans of paying it forward here at, uh, at Treasury Talent. So we, we totally understand what, what you're saying. Now, I want to just ask you, you, you've pivoted from the banking side to the corporate side. What was the catalyst to, to make that move? Um, I think for me, one of the most important thing was um, I wanted to. I had that desire to transit from banking into corporate. And because I had that desire to, to pivot, um, I was willing to take on every obstacle and every challenge that I had. Because it's very easy for you to say, uh, you know, why do I need to sub subject myself to so much, you know, trying to get through, I might as well just stay in my, in my lane. But I wanted to, so that was the first thing, the desire was there. Uh, the second thing was I needed a break. I needed someone to believe in me and for me, to, for, for, for that person to say, yes, you want to move from banking to corporate and I'll give you this opportunity to do that. When I, the last rule I had in Nigeria, um, was in Treasury. And when I came to England in 2006, I really wanted to work in Treasury. Um, and, and this is, and I'm sure there are people who are who probably watch this and, and, and be able to key into this experience. One of the things I was told them was I didn't have UK experience. I had this basket load of experience working for international banks, uh, worked in Treasury, but hey, you don't have UK experience. Sorry, we can't trust you working in Treasury. Um, so, so that desire was there. But then my break came when um, I was working for Bank of America and I wanted to, I really wanted to go into corporate and I saw this opportunity with John Lewis, but it was a, it was a, um, it was a contract role. It wasn't a permanent role, but I went for it. And I went for it because I knew that if I prove myself at corporate level, I will get opportunities from there on. But I had to take that chance of leaving a full-time role in Bank of America to go to a contract role for one year in John Lewis uh, to look after cash management. But it was, a, it was a deliberate decision I took because I wanted it. And I felt that that was the right thing to do for my career. Obviously not everybody would take that chance, but I needed that break. And I was fortunate enough that the, the person that interviewed me said, you know what, I think you can do this job. And the rest is history, you know. But you need that break to make that transition. Um, what you get a lot is people will say, well, you know, you, you don't have um, corporate treasure experience. And, and the interesting thing there is one of the things I was always told then was when you come from a banking background, whether this is true or not, I don't know. But in a few interviews that I went for, what I was told was when, when you're coming from a banking background, banking is very fast paced. You know, uh, people believe that when you're in banking, you're very cultural, you're very uh, focused on deliverables. And sometimes in corporate, you know, we're not like, you know, we're not like that. We just, you know, so we don't know whether you get the right culture fit. And I used to say, well, you know, I've worked in corporate back in Nigeria, so I can do this. No, we're, we're not sure. Um, and that was one of the interesting things I found, that culture used to be a big, big issue for the guys in corporate to so allow guys in banking to come over. I've since found that that's not really an issue. But it's a perception you have of people in banking that maybe they may not have the right culture fit. Um, but yeah, so so that's that that's one of the um, I would say the obstacle that I had and how I was able to transition across and the sacrifice I made. It was a deliberate um, design that I had to take that chance. Uh, maybe if I didn't take it, maybe I would never be able to cross over. But I decided to take that chance. So it actually, it's a, it's a really good segue to a question that we got um, from, uh, from Michael, um, Michael Gersh. Thanks for the question, Michael. And that is, and it, it sounds like perhaps you may have answered it a little bit, but if you want to uh, kind of expound on this, Adesola, uh, okay. he asked, how do you make the jump to another country? Now, granted, we're talking about, you know, returning to some semblance of normalcy first, right? Um, we're, we're talking about post-COVID, uh, but um, any advice to our listeners and, and to a guy like me who's just spent uh, my entire life, you know, up on, on the mountaintop in Utah? Um, <laughs> how, do you, how, do you make a, how do you make a move to another country? Um, so my dad played a big factor in who I am, who I've become today. Um, as a child growing up in Nigeria, one of the things that um, I got on very quickly was my dad was an engineer. 
And in those days, we used to have a lot of um, engineers coming in from the Eastern, from, um, from the Soviet bloc. Um, they used to come to Nigeria to come and do bridges and roads and support all that. So I used to go to my dad's office and I'll meet all these expatriate engineers and we'll get talking. And from that age of my dad, I always instilled in me that I could be anything I wanted to be. I could work anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter what you look like. Um, so I, I've, I've always had this desire to go abroad. You know, I thought, you know, I want to go abroad. And for me then, uh, it was a place like New York. London wasn't really such a big pull for me, but New York, Singapore, Hong Kong, there are places I wanted to go and work. So I had that desire there. But I was quite clear in my mind that going abroad doesn't mean that I'm going into um, this place where everything is lined with gold. My expectations were were real. I understood what I was getting into. Mm. Um, and then it also was between the UK and Canada. Um, I started working on it at the same time. The UK uh, immigration came out first, so I came in into England. But I was quite clear about the challenge I was going to face. Maybe I was a bit surprised. Um, so the first thing for me was the desire was there to come to make that direct relocation. The second thing was I understood clearly that it wasn't going to be a walk in the park that this was going to be tough, but I was ready mentally for it. Uh, because I, 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 one thing I always say is, if you don't have confidence in yourself, you cannot expect somebody else to have confidence in you. You must retain your confidence in yourself. Even no matter the challenges you go through, that little confidence you have in your ability to deliver, you should, you should protect it as much as you can. Um, so I had that, even when I was getting knocked back saying I didn't have UK experience, I didn't, bother me that much because I knew I needed one chance and they give me that chance I'll prove myself. So for me, the first thing, like I said, is you have to have the desire to move. Secondly, you have to understand what does that mean for you as a person. Um, if you have a family, what does that mean? And you will be competing with people for jobs. It's not going to be you know, given to you. So you have to be ready to compete. And um, I suppose the last thing is the desire you have, you have to be clear in your mind, what is your why? For me, it wasn't just about the job. I wanted to create a future for my daughter. And for me, that was a big why. So failing was not an option for me, but I was also very clear in my mind, the challenges that was going to be here. So in a nutshell, um, you have to want it. You have to be mentally prepared, understand what are the, the requirements of the country you're moving into not just for work purposes, but the society itself. How can you fit into the society? Do, do the values reflect what you want to be? And then what is your why? What really is pushing you to make that jump? Because when things are tough, that why will always be there and never lose your self-confidence. Keep your self-confidence and keep working hard. And I'm a, I'm, I'm a good example of it, right? I, I didn't go to an Ivy League university. I didn't school in this country, nothing. But you know, if you decide hard enough, you can't get it. And of course, you need the big break. I keep talking about it. You need the big break. And my big break was um, ABN AMRO. I had these two women that had an interview for me, fantastic managers that I had. And they looked at me and they said, you know what? We'll give you the opportunity when everybody said they didn't have UK experience and the rest, you know? So the big break is always very important for me. And I was lucky enough to have it in Manchester with ABN AMRO. Yeah, that, that's, I mean, and on that note, you know, it, to your point, it, it's, um, those people that are willing to give you that break and, and really the leaders that will see um, that confidence that, you know, that you possess yeah. and, and, and your potential. Um, now you've been able to, you're, you're now able to pay it forward. And uh, we know just from prior conversations, how passionate you are about mentorship and coaching um, and, and being a leader. So um, yeah. can you, can you talk to us a little bit about where that passion comes from? I think, I think everybody here probably has a pretty good sense for what you're going to say, but, uh, um, but, but yeah, tell us a little bit about your passion for leadership. So I went to, um, I went to boarding school. Now that doesn't make me posh. I, I think we, I need to explain that. <laughs> that doesn't make me posh by any chance. Um, um, I come from a middle-class family, but I was fortunate enough to get to boarding school um, in Nigeria. And that, to me, that's where my leadership skills was first honed because I started to take responsibility 
and I could I could ask people to do things. But basically, when you get into a crisis situation, I was I saw myself being able to stand in there and pull my my age mates together to get things done. And then when I went to university, I got involved in student union politics. Um, and that is really getting involved in um, your departmental politics where you're choosing your, you know, your, um, what do they call them then? Um, some, some form of parliament anyway for students. And that, that's how I started to develop my leadership skills. I could see myself being able to coordinate, to give direction, to support, and then I started a, a, a club then, which was, we were all in our later years in uni, but we will we'll come back, come around in the evening and provide lectures for younger students in the university. So we would gather them around and we'll be teaching them, uh, which was something unique then in my department, because of course we're not lecturers, but this was something we took upon ourselves to develop these younger uh, students. So I started to build that kind of, you know, leadership traits and, and, and competencies in me. And over the years that I've gone on, one of the things I've found really that excites me is developing people. I'm really excited about developing people. But I need to, I need to, to kind of um, put a caveat to that. Developing people, not in, sense, not in terms of imposing my ideas on them, but for me, it's more about sharing my story and my experiences and then they can take the, the lesson from there and apply it as a dim fit. And that's something I've always enjoyed doing. Um, I, when, I was, um, when I was working for Hog Robinson, and I think this story may give you an example of you know, how I look at uh, developing people. Um, sometimes in the, in the, in the afternoon, there's a, there was a, uh, I was in a town called Farnborough in England, a, a very small town there. And sometime in the afternoon, I would go to the chapel. They had a small chapel in the town. Um, and I would go there to just have a quiet time um, and to meditate and all that. And when I was going to this chapel, they had this, this graveyard in front of the chapel. And you need to walk through the graveyard to get to the chapel there. And every day when I walked through this graveyard, I used to think to myself, you know, all these people here, lying here, they all have experiences and knowledge and skill set that has gone with them that they, they can't share and they haven't shared with anybody. And I think that's how a lot of us are. We have so much knowledge, experience and things to share, but we don't, either because we are afraid or we feel I have nothing to share. And we take these experiences with us, we don't share it. And for me, developing people is about saying, you know, let me tell you my experience here if you want to know, and then this is the lesson I've learned, and then you can take your lesson from there. And I think as a leader, that is partly your responsibility is to be able to build people up, but not be, don't hide that knowledge from them. Don't keep it so that you're the only guy that knows in the room and nobody else knows. Share that knowledge and then let people grow. And for me, it's, 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 a, it's a powerful motivator for me. And it's also about, I always believe that if you're a manager, you're a leader, you should produce other leaders. If you're not doing that, then there has to be something wrong with your system or with, with, with the direction you give. So I have people that I've, that I've led in all my career that I see keep in touch with. Some of them have gone on to become senior managers and VPs and AVPs in banks all over. And I take pride in that when I still get in touch with them and we talk about the good old days. So for me, um, developing people is something I'm very passionate about. But that, that, that's my philosophy towards developing people. I'm passionate about it. I, I take it as part of my responsibility as a leader and it's, it's core to what I do. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, I'm very much the same way where, uh, you know, it's more of a, hey, I'm gonna tell you what's worked for me or what I've learned from this. It's having that vulnerability. Um, Scotty probably hears way more of it than he ever cares to even know about me, but that's, uh, that's, that's the, the price, I guess, of working with me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and, and I know another area that kind of ties into what we had talked about is what you're, what you're doing with the younger generation to help them develop, but also introduce them to treasury. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so one of the things I'm, I'm equally passionate about, I've spoken about developing people is I, I support charities a lot. 
Um, I think as professionals, we give money and a lot of us do a lot of donations to charity, which is fantastic. The one thing I found is that we don't, we don't give enough of our skill and expertise to charities. Um, and that is one thing that they lack because they cannot afford to pay market rate to get the kind of expertise that they need. So they rely on professionals who would donate their time. And one of the things I've found is that a lot of people feel, well, I don't have the time to give. But I always say, well, you know, even if you give an hour, it, an hour here, then and, and everywhere, it's, it's worth something. You always find charities that would appreciate that one hour you want to give them or two hours in a month to give them. It, it's, it's substantial. So that's my, one of the things I'm passionate about is, is working for charities. And part of that is motivating young people. Um, supporting them in terms of growth. One of the charities I started working with a few years ago was called Working Options. And what we do is we go to um, six forms, what you call six forms in the UK, that's the year before you go to university. And we'll go there and we'll share a story. <clears throat> so we have professionals that have, that have signed on to this. Uh, Pre-COVID, obviously, we go to the schools and we talk to them about our career journey. We talk to them. And the idea really is that if we can't do it, so can you. Right. So they look at us and say, well, you know, they, they, they can see themselves in us, uh, you know, and, and that's why for me, it's very motivational when you finish this, these sessions and these students come up to you to ask you questions about finance, about treasury, about credit or all the other things I've done. Um, but over and above that, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm quite conscious of is that treasury, we don't in my view, we don't do enough giving as a body of professionals. Uh, so I'll, I'll use two examples here. Last, uh, early this year, I started running a free um, workshop and it's called Day in the Life of a Transactional Finance Manager. And what I do is, um, so, so if you look at most students, right, they understand accounting, they understand finance in a broad sense. Mm -hmm. But some of the things that make up the transitional finance, so you're looking at accounts payable, accounts receivable, bank reconciliation, payment, treasury operation, it's not something that typically would be quite exposed to when you're in, in secondary school, in high school. You, you don't get exposed to that, to that bit. So I put together a workshop and I was fortunate enough to be, to be, um, to be invited by Nottingham University Business School in England. And I went and delivered this to our workshop. And some of the students are not head of treasury. I mean, they don't know what treasury is, you know, and these are people in business school. And to me, that was powerful. So I delivered this, this workshop and then afterwards I got the feedback from them. And there were quite a few people who were quite really um, surprised how much they could pick up in that, that, those two hours. It's, it's a workshop that I'm hoping to do for other universities when COVID is over. Um, I, I've spoken to a few universities that I, I'm, I'm hoping that I can deliver that to their business business school, because I think it's important for us to start, you know, fleshing out this part of finance so that people can see that actually they can make a career. For example, as a director of shared service center, manager of shared service center, that is an opportunity out there. The other thing um, that I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm doing now, let me use the word doing, is um, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to work with one of the corporates to start doing um, almost like Introducing treasury as a career very early on uh, to students uh, in in, high, in um, late secondary school in England or in early university level is to start introducing treasury to them as a career. I don't think we do enough of that as a body. Um, I don't think we reach out to people very early in their career, very early when they are making up their mind what what courses can they go into. Say, hey, there's treasury here. It's a profession you can go into. It's a profession that is very profitable. I think we need to do a lot more of that. Um, and uh, so a, a few days ago, I, I, was, um, I spoke at the fourth Asia, Asia Treasury Management Summit um, held out of Singapore. It was, it was virt virtual, but I, I presented a paper there on corporate social responsibility and the role of treasury in that. And funny enough, <laughs> funny enough, um, I personally feel that um, that's an area again that Treasury is not doing um, a lot to distinguish ourselves there. 
And I think because we hold the posting of the organization, we're well placed within an organization that is, we have a, a big role to play in championing corporate social responsibility. And the point I was making in that conference was, now when cash is tight, now when people are struggling, it's a good time for companies to go into that space and sell their brand. Because people will remember when the pandemic is over, who stretched their hands out to them. And I was saying that there are a lot of organizations who are local organizations, charities, that you can support and support people with as much as you can during this crisis. And we shouldn't walk away from that space because even more now, more than ever before, it's a good opportunity. And it's a place where you can use those to you know, influence schools and young people at this point in time. So that's something I'm driving um, to see whether you know, we can get into that space and try to, to help young people in schools to sell treasury, to, to show that there's a career treasury early on. Um, yeah, so th those are some of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm doing. Uh, I'm thinking about doing and things I'm doing, yeah. At a solar, I've, I'm, uh, I love hearing this because I'm a big advocate of the fact that there isn't a group of graduates who come out in Treasury every year. Um, I think that we need to be promoting Treasury to, to the younger folk, be it high school. That's a great to start that early, um, yeah. but definitely at university level because, you know, everyone comes out and goes into something and then they fall into Treasury. And yeah. you know, we, we need to have a, a, you know, a supply of people coming in that know what Treasury is and are wanting to get into it. Um, at, at a lower level um, rather than just coming in at more senior end. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I came into Treasury by accident. It wasn't, I did wake up, I said, I want to be Treasury. I came into Treasury by accident. I enjoyed it and I stayed. And there are quite a lot of people who end up in Treasury. And, and uh, in England, for example, you don't have any university that offers a degree in Treasury management. It's not done. So you get to read finance or something and then end up in Treasury. And I think if we start early, if we start to, to talk about ourselves that we're more than just numbers, we're just, we're more than, um, so, so for example, you have treasurers gathered around, we tend to talk about cash flow management, we talk about automation, we talk about you know, uh, managing risk, we talk about all the things that are very technical, but we also should talk about the other things that are non-technical, that's what would get people interested in the profession and then they stay. Otherwise, we just come across as people who are, you know, very good technically, very good in looking after cash, very good in the things that we know, but we are not tempting people into the profession. And I think we need to do a lot more of that. And that's an area I'm quite, I'm quite keen to, to get involved with. And, and, so, and more, more especially, sorry, let me just add, more especially um, in, the, in the ethnic minority is also very important for me. Again, that's an area where I'm quite, uh, quite keen to push. Um, I think, I don't know about the US and I don't know about um, Asia, but I know that in Europe and, and, and continental Europe, in England, continental Europe, you don't have a lot of people from ethnic minority who are at very senior level in treasury. And I think that's an area, again, where I'm quite keen to start to, to um, talk to young men and women who are from ethnic minority from in terms of diversity to start to encourage them to get into treasury and show them that you can be successful making a career within treasury. So that's, that's something I'm also very keen to push. Um, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm hoping that I can work with at least one or two corporates in the UK to start to put a program in place where we can encourage um, young men and women to go, to go into treasury because they can see people like me there. That, that's exactly the question I was going to ask, Adesola, and I think you answered it or, you know, already in terms of, of the practical way to do that because, um, you know, just to call, call it what it is here, here the three of us, you know, white guys uh, don't, can't really speak to, I mean, we know it's a need um, to have diversity and, and ethnic minorities in treasury. But to your point here in the U.S., we notice it as well. Simon does in Australia. And I think, um, you know, if you have any additional thoughts on, on how we can address the, that issue, um, you know, systemically, that's something that we, we'd all love to hear from you on. Um, I, I think to address that issue, the first thing is we need to start doing something. <laughs> and I know that that sounds very obvious, but yes, we need to start doing something. And I think um, for a lot of things to do with diversity and, and how to encourage people from ethnic minority, we think about it. We do the um, the ah, uh, 
Oof, you know, and then life moves on. But I think the first step is to take the first step and say, okay, we identify that we need to do something. What do we need to do? I think it's very simple. We first need to, to start to reach out um, to places where we can get to talk to people that we feel are not adequately represented. And the first question is, what is treasury? If I was to tell you treasury as a career, what would come to your mind? And for most people, when you tell them treasury, they don't quite know. If you tell them what is, who is an accountant, they, they get it, especially at, at you know, very young professionals or, or people who are um, in, in high school or secondary school. So you tell them who is an accountant, they know that. Who is, who is a banker, they kind of know that. Uh, finance, they kind of know finance. But what is treasury, they will not be able to articulate what it means. And I think that's if, if people don't know what it is, then of course, when they are choosing their career, it doesn't come to mind. So we need to be able to have that conversation with them to say, this is treasury, this is what you need to get in. And then we can start the conversation. And I think the second th thing too, is that as professionals, we need to make treasury human. Like I said, when you go to our conferences and you go to, talk, to talks and lectures, it, it's very technical. It is very technical. It doesn't address the issue of, hey, we, don't, we, we should be making this What's the right, what's the right for now? So for example, we might need to start organizing events that are not about cash management, are not about ethics, they're not about automation, they're just about networking to bring people into treasury and bringing treasury, giving it a human face. So that's why I use the example of the corporate social responsibility, for example. So we can start to do that. So that treasury becomes a, a part of the conversation and then people warm to it and then you can, we can start to gradually introduce them to it. But if people see us as just being very technical people who know our job, fantastic. But then, you know, there's, we have to make this human for people to want to be part of it. That we Absolutely. laugh, we have fun. Adesoli, you're striking a great chord with us because we're not technical. As much as we <laughs> uh, we talk to you guys all the time, we're, we're certainly not technical and we bring everything back uh, to careers and, and uh, yeah. You know, the softer skills, the softer parts. And networking is obviously something we're very passionate about. So we've got a few projects going on in the background that uh, that may be able to help um, with uh, with what you're talking about. But I just wanted to make one other point. And, and I think that you know, we've spent a lot of time um, talking from a diversity perspective. Um, Treasury has obviously been very male dominated. So we've spent a lot of time talking about females in Treasury, you know, women in Treasury, which has been yeah. great. I think the next step is is absolutely to start going down that path with uh, minority groups as well. But yeah. the, the yeah. problem with it is it, it takes time. Um, so you can't push a button today and solve the problem tomorrow. You've got to start talking about it today um, and, and in time that will happen. So the best example will be a generation ago, um, you know, th th there weren't a lot of females, whereas now there are. Um, yeah. But it, it doesn't just happen tomorrow. You know, they've got to come, like you said, You've got to go to high schools and universities and start those people starting yeah. to come through so that yeah. in 10 yeah. years' time, those people are, are in, you know, in the room. So, yeah, I think, I think it's definitely something that people have got to be forward thinking on. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and, and just to, to, to buttress your point, if we have a pipeline of high school students and, and, and young men and women that we're encouraging in, when we have conferences, then they get invited there to come to those conferences and see what it feels like to interact because we now have a pipeline of people that were trying to get into the profession. So they don't feel like an outsider. They get invited to fun events, to things that will make them say, well, next year I really want to go there because you know it's, it's not just all about you know, the slides and the presentation, but there's also another side to it. So and I, and I agree with you, it's a long-term project, um, but we need to start now to create that pipeline of people. 100% agree there. It's yeah. uh, to your point, just act, just start, start the conversation, start the, start the awareness, target the groups that you, that need to be targeted, start educating there and then make that connection with the corporates on the other side so you can develop yeah. a talent pipeline. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Scotty, do we have any, any questions for Adesola? Um, You know, we, we, we got, other than Michael, we got one more question. I think, frankly speaking, Joe, um, not to, not to jump the gun here, but I think his question probably would be better addressed in, in an ask a recruiter okay. um, that we've talked about. And I know you put a survey out. Um, do you, like I said, I don't want to jump the gun, but do, do you have a result yet on, on what day we'll be doing that? 
Yeah, so that'll be on uh, on Mondays on your profile, uh, the home of Ask a Recruiter, Scotty John's LinkedIn profile. But uh, yeah, so we'll make that announcement. Keep an eye out on LinkedIn out there. Um, Adesola, again, thank you very much for your time and, and your insight. And you just have a really cool story. I mean, uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you. I know the group has too. We were talking about that earlier, but uh, just what you've accomplished and just the courage that you have and, and being that global citizen and now establishing yourself in the UK is incredible. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you very much for having me here. It's been a pleasure. Perfect. Well, then uh, with that, we'll take you off the hot seat. Treasury Talent Community, uh, Simon's Network, our YouTube community. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for interacting. And we'll see you next week. Take care.